the chronicle of events that unfolded during the first half of the 20th century brought unparalleled achievements in our understanding of the mechanics of flight. From the basic structures of airframes and airfoils, to the applications of thermodynamics and mechanical power, we have seen that the art and science of aeronautics moved forward at an exceptional pace. If we look back at the origins of these accomplishments, we learned that they were often won at great cost, but also great reward. Our engineering history should be celebrated for its steadfast record of successes and failures that have advanced us to the current state of the art. In part one, we examine the major advances in air power from its state immediately following the First World War, up through the 1920s and 1930s to a time known as the Golden Age of Aviation. All things seemed possible as our means to navigate the skies became more commonplace and capable. Today, in part two, we will see that a quantum shift in politics was driving Europe, Asia, and eventually the United States to an inevitable clash of power. This can be viewed as the impetus for even more rapid technological advances, especially in the fields of aeronautics and weaponry. Where Europe had seen only modest aeronautical progress following the Great Depression, an emergence in military expansion within a few years' time began to reverse that trend at an alarming rate. The development of modern aero engine technology in Germany accelerated during the early 1930s. Junkers' experimental liquid-cooled concepts gelled around their first modern inverted V12, the UMO 210. Tests began just prior to the establishment of the RLM, which thereafter controlled specifications for all state-sponsored contracts. First run in 1932, the supercharged inverted V12 produced 600 horsepower, making it approximately equivalent to Rolls-Royce already successful Kestrel. The later Yumo 210G version featured automatic mixture control, a direct fuel injection system, and a two-speed supercharger. The displacement was 19.7 liters, and it developed 720 horsepower at 2,700 RPM, powering the first production versions of the BF-109, JU-87 Stuka, and the BF-110, among others. The Hispano HS-12 series of V-12 engines began development in France in 1932 as their industry's first modern high-power V-12. It featured cylinder blocks cast with integral heads being nearly leak-proof. The side-mounted induction pipes fed three Solex carburetors each, serving two cylinders. Supercharged with a displacement of 36 liters, weighing 1,025 pounds, the HS-12 initially made 824 horsepower and was later developed up to 1,085 horsepower. The engine was used to power nearly all of the last French fighter designs prior to their 1940 capitulation, including the Marine Saulnier MS-406. One of the basic design features was a hollow propeller shaft as a provision for a motor cannon to be mounted between the cylinder banks. The Hispano HS-12Y was licensed to be built in the Soviet Union by Klimov, resulting in their 750 horsepower M100 derivative. Further enhancements increased allowable RPM, leading to the Klimov VK-105 series, powering all versions of the Yakolev fighters. As a means of achieving greater power with a smaller frontal exposure, the concept of twin-row radial engines was investigated by Pratt & Whitney beginning in 1929. 
both the R1535 Twin Wasp Jr. and the R1830 Twin Wasp emanated from this work. Early versions of the Twin Wasp were rated at 630 horsepower and increased in successive versions to 1200 horsepower. Saversky Aircraft's 1936 design, the P-35, utilized the R-1830-45 rated at 1,050 horsepower. Grumman's concurrent design, its first modern monoplane naval fighter, the F-4F Wildcat, also incorporated the twin WASP, the F-4F-3 using the R-1830-76 with a two-stage supercharger for enhanced altitude performance, was rated at 1,200 horsepower. United Airlines ordered their Douglas DC-3s with Pratt & Whitney twin WASPs. Consolidated's B-24, contracted as a complementary high-altitude heavy bomber to the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, was powered by turbo-supercharged R-1830-65 twin WASPs in late versions, developing 1,200 horsepower. In 1933, Rolls-Royce began work on a private venture it called the PV-12. The design borrowed on technology developed from the Kestrel project and was a somewhat protracted affair in its refinement. Variations of cylinder bank construction and combustion chamber design finally resulted in a successful V12 of 1,647 cubic inches, developing 1,045 horsepower at 3,000 RPM by 1936. The introduction of high-octane fuel and 70-30 ethylene glycol coolant figured prominently. Early Merlins featured prominent ejector-style exhaust tails to capture thrust from the high-energy exhaust gases. During 1936, work was being promoted by the Air Ministry to advance the development of the Merlin for both the Hurricane and Spitfire fighters as it was foreseen that they would soon be in great demand. Two-speed supercharging in the Merlin 20 series was followed by further aerodynamic improvements in the supercharger inlet elbow and supercharger diffuser in the Merlin 45 to produce up to 1,480 horsepower at 12,000 feet. Through these single-stage supercharged versions, the Merlin carried the water for both RAF fighter and bomber commands. However, its full potential was yet to be seen. The Allison Engineering Company in Indianapolis, Indiana, had been engaged by the U.S. Army to advance the state-of-the-art in connecting rod bearings for their enormous supply of Liberty engines in use following the First World War. Norman Gilman's resulting steel-backed bearing concept had far-reaching implications for all high-powered engines to follow. Allison's efforts to develop a high-power V12 engine roughly paralleled in time that of Rolls-Royce initial work on the Merlin. Slow progress for the Allison, however, was more attributable to the U.S. Army's insistence on changing the requirements. Each engine was pioneering new ways of sustaining in excess of 1,000 horsepower. Design goals included efficient fuel consumption and power-to-weight characteristics. The engine employed four valves per cylinder, centrifugally cast aluminum cylinder banks, and an integral 9.5-inch supercharger impeller. The resulting V1710 was the first aero engine to pass a stringent 150-hour test at 1,000 horsepower in April 1937. Of the many problems solved, Chief Engineer Ron Hazen addressed the issue of mixture distribution, which resulted in the ram's horn induction manifold. 
the internal spur type reduction gear design was employed in the interest of streamlining the installation resulting in the long tapered nose reduction gear case. Versatility was also one of the design goals which produced an engine that could turn in right or left hand direction with a minimum of specialized parts. It could also be utilized as a pusher or tractor with a possible remote propeller gearbox and of greater significance be compatible with turbo supercharging. Curtis Aeroplane's re-engine P-36 Hawk, the P-40B C Series Tomahawk became the first production fighter to operate with the V-1710. These were sold to Great Britain and France and gained particular fame with China's American Volunteer Group. Lockheed's answer to the emerging possibilities afforded by the new Allison engines took form in 1939 as their Model 22, using twin Allison V1710 C series engines mated with GE turbo superchargers. The streamlining afforded by the long nose case is evident. Design work began in 1930 at Daimler Benz on a 30 liter V12 engine and materialized in 1932 as the DB600 under test. The RLM recognized the need and subsequently ordered production for new fighter designs already in progress. Daimler-Benz followed their DB600 in 1935 with a successor, the DB601. This version featured 33.9 liters, weighed 1,300 pounds, and initially developed 1,050 horsepower. The inverted V12 arrangement allowed a nose-mounted weapon to fire through the hollow propeller shaft. Messerschmitt's redesigned BF109E benefited first from the new engine over the earlier UMO 210 powered versions. Daimler's transverse mounted supercharger, typically mounted on the left side of the engine, employed a novel hydromatic coupling for infinitely variable supercharger speeds, automatically regulated by barometric pressure. The late version, DB601N, improved output to 1,250 horsepower up to 7,000 feet using higher octane rated C3 fuel for the BF109E4N version, and were first employed on the Channel Coast by Adolf Galland's JG26 Schlagere Group. The DB601 gave the Luftwaffe units a brief advantage over the channel as their direct fuel injection handled negative G maneuvers without power interruption. As with Daimler-Benz developments with the DB600 and 601, Junkers Motor Invert, aka UMO, responded to a specification for a 1,000 horsepower V12 by the German Air Ministry. Their UMO 210H was used as the basis, and the resulting UMO 211A was finalized at just under the 1,000 horsepower rating at 2,300 RPM. Retaining the direct fuel injection and two-speed supercharging, development continued with increased RPM and was offered in various supercharger gear ratios and propeller reduction gear ratios. While Daimler had captivated the RLM's interest in lightweight V12s for smaller fighter projects, Junkers UMO 211 similarly succeeded in bomber projects forthcoming. Dedicated propeller gearing and power for slower speed envelopes specialized them in these roles. While Junkers' own bomber projects required the UMO 211, until these engines were available, they initially made do with substitutes for their early prototypes. The JU-87 Stuka dive bomber originally flew with a Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine, as did the BF-109, but then initial production types flew with the UMO-210 and subsequently the UMO-211. Junkers' superb multi-role JU-88 Schnell bomber 
Project of 1935 entered production with the Yumo 211B-1 engines of 1,200 horsepower. These engines were developed in a system that produced modular units known as Kraft I, or Power Egg. These all-inclusive power modules allowed fast removal and replacement of the entire firewall forward and further allowed other types in development to incorporate them, simplifying design specifications. The Yumo 211 was Germany's most produced engine of the Second World War at more than 68,000 produced. In 1937, Japanese military planners pressed for advanced aircraft developments to support their continued conquest of the Far East. Planners demanded more modern fighters, especially for the Imperial Japanese Navy. Issuing a specification for a new lightweight, long-range, highly maneuverable shipboard fighter, naval leadership intentionally raised the bar higher than was thought possible. Mitsubishi designer Jiro Horikoshi exquisitely crafted all of these features into an airplane that was effectively years ahead of its time. While competitor Nakajima bowed out of the competition, considering the requirements unreachable, Mitsubishi's team applied every possible material and technique to achieve these goals, incredibly with only 780 horsepower available from their Zuise 13 radial engine at hand. The Navy demanded a higher horsepower engine, the Nakajima Sakai Model 12, while the airplane was in early development. The 14-cylinder two-row engine was an outgrowth of the company's earlier licensing of the Gnome 14K. The 1700 cubic inch engine first developed 940 horsepower in 1937 and featured a simple single speed supercharger. For its first two years in service, the Zero was unmatched in its air superiority role. Increased fuel capacity and the addition of an 85 gallon streamlined drop tank lent it extremely long range, paying dividends on long range escort missions over the water. This range capability was not surpassed until 1943, and that accomplished by the Merlin powered P 51 Mustang carrying external drop tanks. A further developed version of the Sakai engine led to the most effective version of the Zero, the Model 52, which used the 1130 horsepower Sakai 21, featuring a two-speed supercharger, which, with water methanol injection, boosted it to 1230 horsepower. The Imperial Japanese Army adopted the Sakai 21 engine for numerous types, including the ultra-agile Nakajima KI-43 Hayabusa, translation Peregrine Falcon. Following the initial use of the V-1710 in Curtis and Lockheed fighters, development continued. From the outset, one of the goals espoused by the Allison V-1710 program was to be its construction, allowing different versions from the same basic core. This allowed variations in crankshaft rotation, supercharger accessories, and gearbox attachment for either tractor or pusher configurations. Earlier versions of the V1710 were effectively limited to 1,150 horsepower by their internal spur reduction gearbox. The succeeding F-Series raised the thrust line because of the change to a crankshaft pinion with external spur reduction gear arrangement. Allison's commitment to continual testing and upgrade of the V1710 resulted in successively increasing maximum power ratings available. Allison's earlier investigation of pressurized coolant systems and the use of 30-70 Prestone to water ratios were standardized in all subsequent versions and later. This also served to allow better detonation margins as cylinder head temperatures were reduced by up to 50 degrees. 
power ratings for the V1710 F series edged upwards from 1150 horsepower to 1425 horsepower over a series of versions and applied technology in higher octane fuels. As the well-tread legend has it, the British inquired with North American Aviation as to building Curtis P-40s for the RAF in 1939. North American countered with a proposal to build their own design. The V-1710-39 version chosen employed an altitude-rated supercharger gearing for the first time, validating the original modular concept. North American promised a better airplane and incorporated newly developed aerodynamic data into the wing and fuselage shape and the integration of the cooling system. Two of these aircraft were retained by the U.S. Army for testing and designated XP-51. In a political move to take advantage of the Mustang's inherent potential, Army procurement management ordered an attack version capable of dive bombing simply to get the new fighter into larger scale production and develop its assets. 500 were ordered with lower altitude rating of 1,350 horsepower at 2,500 feet. This hot rod version also had a new war emergency rating of up to 1,500 horsepower at 52 inches manifold pressure up to a critical altitude of 5,400 feet. Lockheed's P-38 Lightning underwent many late-life transformations as the Allison V-1710F models matured. The topic of maximum allowable engine ratings was much debated between the Army and engine manufacturers. To squeeze more performance out of existing designs, many tests were conducted to see just what the engine could indeed survive. The P-38's leading-edge intercoolers, while an ingenious design, were a bottleneck to the high-altitude power that could be made by the Allison. Redesigned to incorporate conventional air-to-air intercooling heat exchangers under the engines improved the situation for the P-38J and later models. What was lost in aerodynamic contour was more than made up for in maximum continuous horsepower available. The P-38L's V-1710F-30 incorporated all of the many improvements Allison had developed for the coming G-Series, including a new crankshaft with 12 smaller counterweights, strengthened crankcase, and keystone piston rings designed to minimize ring blow-by at high power. For the last production version of the Lightning, the V-1710-111-113 version delivered 1,725 horsepower at 3,000 RPM at sea level. Among the earliest versions of the V-1710, the E-Series employed an adaptation to a remote gearbox via extended drive shaft. The Bell XFM Aracuda demonstrated this arrangement in 1937. One of the issues attendant with the remote drive was a requirement for greater torsional vibration damping. A revision to the existing friction type damper moved it to the supercharger coupling and utilized the supercharger as a flywheel for momentum in combination with a hydraulic damper. Stiffer extension drive shafts significantly improved balance and reduced the various vibration harmonic modes. Bell's design submitted to the Army's 1937 request for interceptor proposals employed the remote drive with the V1710E mounted behind the cockpit with a general electric turbo supercharger included below it. A multitude of aerodynamic issues and some Army expedients resulted in the elimination of the turbo supercharger installation, but prominently featured a tricycle landing gear and a provision for heavy nose mounted armament. Bell's P-39 was ordered into production despite not fulfilling its altitude and speed performance requirements and was therefore available like Curtis P-40s 
when modern fighters were in short supply at the outbreak of war. Bell followed the P-39 with a larger and updated version, the P-63 King Cobra, that incorporated various improvements. Among the P-39's shortcomings were its range, speed, and altitude performance. The King Cobra was similar but larger and could carry more internal and external fuel. The P-63 was also considerably faster, utilizing a laminar flow airfoil. An auxiliary stage supercharger with hydraulic coupling gave the King Cobra superior altitude performance. In the last examples of the King Cobra flown under test, the P-63F featured the Allison V-1710E-30 two-stage engine which developed 1,150 horsepower at 27,000 feet. A war emergency rating of 2,200 horsepower at 3,200 RPM on 100 inches of manifold pressure was available at 13,000 feet using 115-145 performance number fuel. The P-63F is reported to have climbed to 20,000 feet in three minutes. In 1937, Pratt and Whitney continued their pursuit of the large radial engine with the design of their R-2800 double wasp. Since many of the engineering principles of high output radial engines had been previously established, progress with the R-2800 initially moved swiftly. The XR-2800 initially produced 1,850 horsepower at 2,600 RPM. Although the initial design benefited from their experience in large two-row engines, this project would push the boundaries yet further. Tackling extremely difficult concepts, such as torsional vibration and cylinder head design and manufacture to handle previously unseen levels of heat rejection, Chief Engineer Luke Hobbs led his team through a long process of trial and error to understand the required solutions. The crankshaft was dynamically balanced with pendulum-type counterweights and second-order spring-gear-driven counterweights. The engine was designed to offer a maximum flexibility in application, affording installation as fan-cooled pusher, tractor, and with either single or two-stage supercharging or turbo supercharging. The first R2800 was installed for flight in the Chance Vought XF4U Corsair in May of 1940. The experimental Corsair was the first single-engine fighter to exceed 400 miles per hour in level flight. Republic Aircraft Corporation's massive P-47 Thunderbolt design was forwarded to the U.S. Army and first flew in May 1941, powered by the R-2800-17. It followed the earlier Seversky arrangement with a remote turbo supercharger mounted in the aft fuselage, with provision for intercooling in the ducting that returned the compressed airflow to the engine's induction system. The Thunderbolt was the largest, heaviest single-engine fighter produced during World War II, and the 56th Fighter Group ended the war as the highest-scoring American group of the war, exclusively flying P-47 Thunderbolts. Experimental tests for a lightweight version of the Thunderbolt featured a revised cowl, with fan cooling and jet thrust exhaust. Equipped with an R2800-14W with water injection and an experimental wide cord Curtis Electric propeller, it was dubbed Superbolt. Test pilot Mike Ritchie flew the Superbolt over a calibrated course at 34,000 feet on August 4, 1944, achieving a speed of 505 miles per hour. The highest speed recorded in level flight by any propeller-driven fighter during World War II. Grumman developed a successor to its F4F Wildcat in June of 1941. First flown in October 1942, the Grumman F6F Hellcat was designed to be a tough, 
easy to build, easy to fly, and heavy hitting naval fighter, gaining from the experience of the earlier Wildcat in combat with the Mitsubishi Zero. Production Hellcats all featured the R2800 10 or 10W water injected variant with two stage supercharging. The engine stage impeller ran at fixed speed and was used solely below 12,000 feet. Above 12,000 feet, the aux stage was engaged and operated in low between 12,000 and 25,000 feet. High speed was selected above 25,000 feet. Intercooling was employed between the auxiliary and engine supercharger stages. The Grumman F6F record tells the story with over 5,000 enemy aircraft destroyed during the war. It continued to be employed by the U.S. Navy until 1954 as a night fighter. Starting with the R2800-18W, a complete redesign of the engine was accomplished to strengthen the engine as it made more power. A one-piece crankcase center section, forged cylinders, fluid coupled aux stage supercharger and vacuum powered spark advance were some of the features. Late and post-war fighter projects were designed to employ these improved versions of the R2800 and included the Grumman F7F Tiger Cat. Designed as a long-range shipboard twin-engine fighter, the Grumman F8F Bearcat designed as a fast-climbing low-level interceptor and the Vought F4U-5 Corsair, whose R2800-32W included two transversely mounted auxiliary stage supercharger impeller units driven by a fluid coupling. More than 125,000 R2800 engines were produced between 1939 and the end of production in 1960. As Rolls-Royce development of the Merlin proceeded, most of the basic elements of the high-power liquid-cooled V12 had been established. Improving the flow of air to the single-stage impeller had yielded significant horsepower increases, which subsequently prompted further investigation into the concept of mass airflow. Rolls-Royce engineer A.C. Lovesy came to the conclusion that any further improvements in altitude performance would require increasing the volume of air moving efficiently through the fixed swept volume of the engine. The concept of two-stage supercharging was not new, but the method of achieving it in a compact space would be. Effectively mounting two superchargers closely spaced with an integral heat exchanger to remove the heat of compression, became the basis for the 60 series Merlin. The result was that 300 horsepower was gained at an altitude of 30,000 feet, and a Spitfire Mark 9 was 70 miles per hour faster than a Spitfire Mark 5 at the same altitude. Viewing the engine from the aft, the two stages of compression, followed by the after-cooling heat exchanger, were very compactly adapted to the Merlin's core. Flowing far greater volumes of air through the Merlin efficiently, handling higher stress loadings, and avoiding detonation were the key to success for British fighters and bombers from 1942 onwards. Fine-tuning of the supercharger design led to specialized gear ratios favoring higher and lower altitude optimizations and further improved low-altitude performance of single-stage Merlins. Improved fuels with a 100 over 150 performance number rating were tested in 1943, which established an increased boost of plus 25 pounds to be used for up to 5 minutes. At low altitude, Spitfire Mark 9s chased incoming V-1 buzz bombs in the summer of 1944, capitalizing on the DASH rating. In a fortuitous move to diversify the production of the Rolls-Royce prize creation, the Packard Motor Car Company of Detroit, Michigan was awarded a $130 million contract after Henry Ford declined the offer. 
Concurrent with supercharger developments, both the British and U.S. Army recognized the potential of the North American P-51 Mustang with an eye to longer range and better altitude performance. The need was clearly understood by 8th Air Force planners as their fleets of heavy bombers began to move deeper into Germany by daylight. Tactical changes to require the ability to carry and then be allowed to drop external fuel tanks as required became doctrine. Beginning in the fall of 1943, the efficiencies of the Mustang's laminar flow wing, coupled with its new high-altitude maximum performance, propelled the bombing offensive into high gear. Converting fighter units to the Mustang into 1944 followed with versions of even greater range and performance. The P-51D was essentially the crowning achievement of Allied cooperation in overwhelming the Luftwaffe in the air and on the ground. Further refinements of the Merlin, both by Rolls-Royce and Packard, continued to advance the capabilities of the engine. Packard's V-1650-9 version applied water methanol injection to allow 90 inches manifold pressure in an effort to inhibit detonation. This feature became standard in final production variant of the Mustang, the P-51H. Changes were made structurally to reduce the weight of the airframe by reducing some of the previously required load limits. A wide cord hollow steel aero products propeller was used to more effectively utilize the additional power of the Dash 9 Merlin. Performance of the Mustang peaked at a time when newer power plant technologies were being introduced. Concurrent with the final version of the Mustang, a long-range version was conceived during 1945 to provide a crew of two overextended bomber escort missions to Japan. Destined to be the last propeller-driven fighter in the USAF inventory, the twin Mustang's extreme endurance was unmatched by newer turbojet aircraft. A P-82B flew 5,051 miles non-stop from Honolulu to Washington, D.C. in February 1947. As Allied fighter performance steadily improved, German engineers were tasked to follow suit. As an expedient, the proven Daimler-Benz DB601 was deemed suitable for an upgrade in displacement. Increasing the bore from 150 millimeters to 154 millimeters increased the displacement from 33.9 liters to 35.7 liters. Altering the ignition timing and intake valve duration increased volumetric efficiency at higher RPM, allowing up to 2,800 RPM and a rating of 1,475 horsepower. The DB605 was applied to the ME109 airframe with only minor alterations. Some of the shortcomings of the 605 were related to material shortages. The switch from ball bearings to plane bearings was hampered by the poor quality of available engine lubricants, causing engine failures and fires. Affecting other German engines as well, shortages of nickel and cobalt resulted in poor corrosion resistance in exhaust valves, leading to detonation and engine failure. Additional expedients were the use of water methanol injection, and nitrous oxide boost. In combination with a higher octane C3 equivalent of 100 octane gasoline, the boosted DB605 AM was rated at 1,775 horsepower for takeoff and limited duration. The DB605 was also fitted to the Messerschmitt 110G night fighters and built under license by Fiat in Italy for Machi and Fiat fighters. It was determined by the Reich's Air Ministry in 1937 that the Luftwaffe should have a second source of fighter airplanes available. Focke-Wulf's chief designer, Kurt Tank, surveyed the available power plants and selected the new BMW 139 under development. 
BMW had licensed built the Pratt & Whitney Hornet in the early 1930s and built an improved version, the BMW 132, which powered the Junkers Ju-52. When the RLM issued a contract for larger radial engine prototypes, both Bromo and BMW forwarded designs. The BMW 139 was selected by Tank as a merger of Bromo with BMW resulted in yet a new engine, the BMW 801. The two-row 14-cylinder 801 displaced 2,560 cubic inches and developed 1,539 horsepower at 2,900 RPM. Advanced features as installed in the FW190 included a fan cooling at three times propeller speed, an integral armored oil cooling radiator built into the cowl lip, and a form of analog engine control coordinating supercharger control, propeller pitch, and spark timing in a single throttle lever. Reflecting Kurt Tank's design philosophy, the FW190 needed to be readily serviced in the field, making use of fully integrated power plant modules. The cowling was designed to accommodate ejector type exhausts in combination with cooling exits, which were subsequently adopted by other aircraft designers. The modular BMW 801 engine units were integrated into many other German aircraft, such as the JU-88R Night Fighter and others. From the early development of the V-12 engines in Great Britain, Germany, and the United States during the mid-1930s, we have seen these power plants more than triple in maximum horsepower output and carry those output levels well into the stratosphere with various forms of multi-stage and multi-speed supercharging and or turbo supercharging. Radial engines push the limits from under 2,000 horsepower to nearly 3,000 horsepower, proving their reliability in combat and their adaptability to very high-speed designs. The requirement to gain the tactical advantage drove the engineering to unimagined levels backed by cubic investments of talent, sweat, and taxpayer money. In part three, we will examine the peak of development of each of these types of internal combustion power and touch upon some of the initial developments of the jet age.